This video is part of Design Byte Season 1, covering game design on The Legend of Zelda, Breath of the Wild. All five episodes are available to watch now, so make sure you check them out after this one. Season 1 will contain some spoilers, so it's recommended that you play Breath of the Wild first before watching these episodes. Enjoy! The final encounter against Ganon in The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild is something that I spent over 300 hours working towards. After scouring Hyrule to find each and every Korok seed, after documenting all of the game's creatures, weapons, and objects with the camera, and after completing all of the side quests and vanquishing all of the overworld mini-bosses, my descent into Ganon's chamber had me ready for a thrilling finish to cap off my adventure. That's not really what I got, so for this episode of Design Bites, let's explore how the Ganon boss fight works, where its shortcomings become apparent, and compare the battle to another classic Nintendo final boss that attempted to do the same thing, but managed to get it right. Let me start out this video by pointing out that I really like how Nintendo's designers implemented the character of Ganon in The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. I think it's great how he was introduced within the first few hours of gameplay as an omnipresent threat, and I like how he has actual gameplay implications with his poisonous malice spread throughout Hyrule. I especially got a kick when the Destroy Ganon mission appeared at the top of my screen just after completing the Great Plateau, since it meant that I could take him on right away and that helped really anchor him into the game world. From his role in the plot, to his visual design, and for giving him mostly off-screen character gameplay implications weaved throughout Hyrule, Nintendo did a good job at handling Ganon on a thematic level. It's just a shame that it kinda falls apart towards the end game of Breath of the Wild. The last part of the adventure starts out on a huge high with Hyrule Castle serving as the final dungeon. It's got killer music, it's a huge step up in difficulty, it's maze-like in structure, and it truly feels like a place suffering from Ganon's takeover for a hundred years. Storming the castle and defeating wave after wave of guardians is a tremendously satisfying feeling of empowerment, and the overall build-up to Ganon is wonderfully designed and executed. Ganon's boss fight is broken into two different phases, one where players fight him as the Calamity Ganon form within the sanctum of Hyrule Castle, and then another where he takes his Dark Beast Ganon form in the fields just outside the structure. There's nothing wrong here with the phased approach, and it's something quite common in the Zelda series. And to be honest, I actually quite like the first half of the battle. Your results for the first phase may vary, because there's an interesting mechanic at play here. If Link has conquered the four Divine Beasts, they'll attack Calamity Ganon as soon as the fight starts, and they'll take his health down by half rendering it a much quicker and easier fight as a reward for regaining control over them. If a player has left a Divine Beast under the control of Ganon's Malice, that respective phantom form of him must be defeated, and Calamity Ganon does not lose the equivalent amount of HP he would have otherwise taken from their attack. I freed all four Divine Beasts during my playthrough, so I only had the half-health version of Calamity Ganon to take down, but I didn't mind it at all. I was actually pleased to find out that the next time around could be much tougher and longer if I decided to forego some of the Divine Beast during my second playthrough. It's really the Dark Beast Ganon phase where things start to fall apart, and they do so pretty much at the very start of this section. Zelda gives Link the Bow of Light and a horse for enhanced mobility. Players are required to hit glowing targets on the side of Beast Ganon's body while he stands there in Hyrule Field. Each successful hit does a good chunk of Beast Ganon's HP, but Ganon himself can't really hurt players. His only attack takes what feels like actual, literal years to fire off, and it's not really much of a threat. It's such a one-sided affair that it's clear that this fight is not supposed to be a final test of a player's skill, but instead is intended to be a nice, visually appealing spectacle that wraps up the plot and theme of the game. Games do this all the time, and I personally tend to be a fan of this approach, but Breath of the Wild gets a few things wrong with its execution. The first issue with the fight is the length of it, because it's just a touch too long for this kind of visual flair. As a general rule, spectacle fights are most effective when they are short and to the point, because otherwise they may as well just be cutscenes. 
If a player isn't challenged and can't lose, it's not something generally worthy of their time regardless of its importance, and I feel like the designers miss that nuance here. The second phase of the final confrontation usually takes me between 5-7 to seven minutes, which I'm willing to bet is pretty close to the amount of time other players took as well. There are even a couple of periods where the fight requires Link to ride around waiting for the glowing targets to reappear, and this waiting time makes Link feel less capable because Ganon is in control of the pace of the fight. Secondly, a final fight like this only works when it's sandwiched between a solid buildup and a strong finisher something that can ramp up the tension to get to this point, and something that can bring it home to a close after it. While I was totally fine with a half HP Ganon Phase 1, I don't think there are a lot of other players that are going to feel the same way. Since that's basically the entire test of skill players are going to get out of this final encounter, a lot of people will feel unsatisfied with the Dark Beast Phase since it doesn't build off the Calamity Ganon portion. To me, the far bigger disappointment was the cutscene after the Beast Ganon phase that the game ended on. It consists of Ganon disappearing and Zelda proclaiming that Hyrule is in a better spot than it was before, but that's pretty much it. Nothing actually changes in the world, and nothing else is shown in the ending, and that was a bit of a letdown for me because I wanted to feel like my actions as a player had a much bigger impact on Hyrule. Not everyone is going to feel this way about the ending cutscene, but to me, it was not a particularly strong one that the Beast Ganon phase led to. There's also a few other things that don't really help the fight bring the game to a close, but these are of much less consequence than the previously mentioned reasons. Zelda gives a lot of dialogue during this contest, which is thematically appropriate, but some of the things she says comes across as a little bit of handholding. She'll tell players to shoot the glowing targets or to use an updraft, and while I'm 100% sure that the designers didn't intend for this to be tutorialized, the way the voice acting is delivered doesn't do a good job of conveying that tone at that time. Ganon's attacks also don't affect the environment much, such as uplifting the ground and wrecking the nearby terrain, and for a fight that's all about visual flair, it's a missing piece that would have made it stronger. On a positive note, the music here is a great remix of the main theme to end the game on, so it's not all downhill from the Calamity Ganon phase, but I think the best way to illustrate how the Ganon fight failed is to compare it to another Nintendo game's final boss that did it right, Super Metroid. If you've never played Super Metroid, then this is your spoiler warning for it. If you would like to jump right back into the Breath of the Wild analysis, you can skip to the time shown on your screen. Super Metroid's final Mother Brain encounter has a lot of similarity to the final Ganon confrontation in Breath of the Wild. Both fights have an area that the main character must go through that serves as a tension buildup before transitioning into a two-phase boss fight before the ending credits roll. Well technically, the Mother Brain fight is actually three phases, but the first one is just a throwback to the original Metroid's ending, and she can't fight back during it. For this comparison, we're looking at the first part of the Mother Brain fight where she can fight back, and it's a pretty standard but thrilling encounter where players must use all their skills to take her down. After it's over, Samus gains access to the Hyper Beam from the Baby Metroid, and that starts the second phase where she then proceeds to absolutely annihilate Mother Brain in Super Metroid's version of a spectacle fight. The game then finishes off with a thrilling escape sequence on the exploding planet Zebus before the game's credits scroll across the screen. Super Metroid's last boss fight has several nuanced differences that all culminate in a much more memorable and thrilling experience than Breath of the Wilds. First, the transition to the second phase is done through a story moment that's been building for the entire game. It's the climax of the story that was intentionally designed to fit within the final boss fight. Zelda giving Link a special bow is a nice little story tidbit, but that's all it really is. Second, the Hyper Beam phase where Samus completely and unequivocally massacres Mother Brain takes no more than a minute or two to finish. This quick pace makes Samus feel so much more powerful than Link in his scenario because the player is in complete control of the pacing of the fight and it never outstays its welcome. Third, and perhaps most critically, there is still a chunk of core gameplay after the Hyper Beam phase that demonstrates the full range of Samus' abilities that players need to utilize before finishing the game. The Zebus escape sequence is not an easy task for some players, and it's definitely something some will fail at, which makes the ending feel so much sweeter because it feels rightfully and triumphantly earned. 
In the end, the Ganon fight at the end of The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild was a good idea from Nintendo that just had a bit of a subpar execution. Nintendo did a great job at developing the character of Calamity Ganon from the very start of the game, but the boss fight against him never lives up to those expectations. The Calamity Ganon phase itself is a great boss fight in my opinion, but the slow pacing of the Beast Ganon section and underwhelming ending means that the game never saves its best for last. For me, I got enough out of Breath of the Wild where I can still think of the endgame as solid with a relatively memorable final Ganon fight, but objectively, past Nintendo games like Super Metroid have done it much better. It's an unfortunate way to end Link's romp throughout Hyrule, but one that Nintendo can learn a lot of lessons from for the future of the series.